Hi everyone, welcome to the Girl Up and Deloitte Impact Day panel. We are so happy to have you join us today. My name is Kristen Corlai, I use she, her pronouns, and we're going to give it just a few minutes for everyone to log in. But now as we're waiting to begin, I would just like to remind everyone about our safety and security policy. Girl Up and this webinar, being part of Girl Up, is a safe space. So by participating in this, we are all agreeing to a called Girl Up Zero Tolerance Policy on Discrimination Based on Race, Ability, Religion, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, Socioeconomic Background, Language, Ethnicity, Worldview, Citizenship, Status, Age, or Class. So as you can tell, we want this really to be a safe space for every single person. So we're all agreeing to uphold the Zero Tolerance Policy on hate speech, bullying, violence, harassment, and exploitation in any possible way it could happen in this digital space. So with that said, it is truly my pleasure to start introducing all of you to what Girl Up is. So Girl Up is inspiring a generation of girls and allies to be a force for gender equality and social good. It truly gives its members a community of like-minded and supportive individuals who are willing to change the world. Through Girl Up, girls can speak up about issues they care about and elevate the discussion on gender equality in their own communities. Unfortunately, there is no place in the world where girls and women experience total equity and equality. You know, gender equality is not just a women's issue, it's everyone's issue. And now that we're all in this panel, we can see it also applies to career. No matter if you want to study a career in STEM or social sciences, we should all care about gender equality in our respective fields. And if you want to speak up and take action, you can join or start a Girl Up Club to combat gender inequality in your community. With this, I am also really excited to introduce one of Girl Up's partners who also believes in this mission. So Deloitte, who is here with us today with some amazing professional women who are here to talk to all of you, provides industry-leading audit, consulting, tax, and advisory services to many of the world's most admired brands, including 90% of Fortune 500 and more than 5,000 private and middle market companies. So if you want to learn more about how Deloitte's more than 300,000 people worldwide make an impact that matters, please go to www.deloitte.com. And now that I see we have more attendees, I would like to remind all of you that this will be an interactive panel. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. We have some amazing questions prepared, but we'd also love to see the amazing topics you want our panelists to cover. So with all of this said, I would like to officially welcome every single one of you to the Girl Up and Deloitte Impact Day panel, as I've said, we are extremely happy and excited for all of you to be here to discuss women in STEM fields, confidence, and what STEM will be like in the future. So I will be your host. My name is Kristen Corlai, as I've said. I am currently a freshman studying civil and systems engineering at Johns Hopkins University. I am based in Monterrey, Mexico, um, and I've been with Girl Up since I was in high school. I co-founded Girl of Monterrey, which was Girl Up's Club of the Year in 2018, and the first Latin American club to win the award. I've been a Girl Up president, I've been part of Team Strong and a co-coalition leader. And as a first robotics alum, I am so passionate about advocating for girls in STEM. And in my field, I would like to advocate for resilient cities to include everyone. So enough about me, I would like to present the amazing panelists that are here with us today. So let's start off um, with Nanjela to introduce herself and we'll hear from all of them. So Nanjela, please take us off. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Nanjela. I'm a manager with uh, Deloitte uh, out of uh, Arlington, uh, Virginia, USA office. Uh, I've been with Deloitte for over 10 years. Uh, my background is in uh, cybersecurity. So I work with clients to make sure they safeguard their information systems. And uh, I'm excited to hear from all of you and also to be part of this uh, panel. Thank you, Colin. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia. I am a senior consultant at Deloitte and also based out of the Arlington, Virginia office. I currently um, am working within the cybersecurity field 
and I've been working about over six years, but my actual educational background uh, is in healthcare. I am also very passionate about helping and, and mentoring people on the side and just my own personal development. So I'm just really excited to be a part of this panel today and hopefully give you all insight about um, my personal experience and share everyone else's. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ayla Haig, and I'm a senior consultant with Deloitte in Washington, DC. A little bit about me, I have over a decade of experience in the energy management and sustainability fields, and I'm excited to share some stories with you all today to help provide insight into the world of STEM for women. Hi everyone, my name is Vaselina Penchev. I'm also out of our Deloitte Arlington slash Washington DC office. I'm a manager um, in our federal and advisory practice. Um, my background is in economics and international finance. Um, I'm very passionate about economics and data analytics. I've worked in the field for uh, over seven years now and I advise our clients how to build digital technologies to, uh, to make better informed investment decisions. So very excited to share about about my background and um, answer any other questions that you all have throughout this. So now let's talk a little bit about why we're all here. You know, we say STEM for social good, but what really is that? So here in Girl Up, we believe that STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, has the potential to empower all of us. And I think right now we're all seeing the importance of STEM in health fields with the ongoing pandemic. We have scientists trying to find a vaccine, healthcare workers treating people, and data analysts trying to keep track of the numbers. Schools have had to innovate how they give education, and activists have had to really be creative in finding ways to spread their message. I think as a society, the perspective of STEM is currently that it's a single lane separate from social sciences or the humanities. But really, we're seeing that STEM is a bridge. You know, we're tracking COVID-19 cases, but the numbers are also providing visibility to pre-existing social inequalities. We're seeing data analysts, uh, social media, and research are gateways for striving for social change. I used to believe STEM wasn't for me because I loved art or because I was a girl. But here, we believe that STEM is not just for STEM people. It's a tool for anyone that wants to change the world. So with that, let's talk a little bit to our wonderful panelists and let's start with question number one. So I want all of you to share what were some pivotal moments in your life, studies or career that led you to be where you are now in your STEM career. So let's start it off with Sadia. We would love to hear what you have to say. Hi, Kristen, thank you, of course. So. Um, I think for me, and honestly, I always tell everybody this. Um, I, if I, 10 years ago, if you asked me where I'd be today or if I'd be in IT, I would not think I would be working within cybersecurity. Uh, I had dreams always of like being a doctor or um, being some, something in the med field. So when I went to college and then I started taking a bunch of courses, once I got to organic chemistry, um, I just realized I was like, this is not so much me. Um, but I still went ahead and I pursued uh, my background in healthcare. I got a bachelor's in public health, and then I went ahead and got a master's in um, health informatics, which is a little bit more related to IT. So that exposed me to um, some aspects of IT. Previously, uh, my family, I have four brothers and they're in IT, so they would always try to get me to do it. And I was like, I absolutely don't want to do it because I just thought it was, I didn't see myself in that role. I thought it was a very not only masculine, but, you know, I had a totally different perception of it, which is not actually what it is. And so um, I had the opportunity of um, actually interviewing with Accenture when I was getting my master's. They came to my campus, and at that time also it was very hard to kind of, you know, I was uh, my second year, my master's, and I was like, all right, where are these jobs? I'm not getting these jobs. But Accenture is giving this entry-level program where basically they said, we will go ahead and actually teach you and train you and everything that you need to do. Um, they're like, it's not hard. If anything, they think the soft skills are harder to learn. So when I saw that, I was like, you know what, this is an opportunity, let me just try it. Um, and it was actually encoding. And so when I started, um, it was one of the best experiences that I've ever done. It was very pivotal for me in my career because at that point, after I did the training and I've seen a lot of the different like 
even perks in working in IT as far as some flexibility that you may have. Um, you know, some of these big firms that we get to work at that really invest in you, just like Deloitte, where there's so much opportunity to go through trainings and learn. I was like, okay, um, I, I went ahead and I stayed. I actually got to work within the healthcare field, and I was actually doing things that I was very passionate about. My first role was um, able to help actually individuals who are deaf, um, able to kind of uh, make sure that websites were accessible for them. So I found a way to make sure that, you know, what I was also passionate about, I was able to work in in IT. So after that, um, you know, I've, I've just been here. Uh, I don't see myself switching careers. It's been over six, seven years. I didn't intend it to be this way, but honestly, I love it and I'm glad I did it. And I think for me, it kind of challenged me in ways where initially I thought it was just something that was not for me or I couldn't do it for whatever reason. And now it's like I, I tell everyone, um, my friends, you know, little sisters, cousins, like, do it. There's something there for you. It's so broad. There's so much to learn. There's so much opportunities. Um, so, yeah, that's my story. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Great. Great. Yeah, sometimes STEM can seem so scary and intimidating until you actually try it. So yeah. now um, let's hear from Nanjela. Please tell us a little bit about these moments in your STEM career. So I would say the moment uh, that I played a pivotal point was when I started my career. Uh, this uh, would be about nine years ago. Uh, so when I started working, my thought process was um, I just assign a task and then I'm doing my task. But uh, I think the uh, when I saw how uh, my involvement and what I did impacts the client, then uh, I was really surprised. So when I first started my career, I was uh, helping uh, clients in uh, financial uh, industry as well as uh, healthcare industry. So financial services industry like uh, banks and healthcare uh, hospitals. So what I was uh, tasked to do is to assess their systems to make sure that, excuse me, <coughs> they have uh, safeguards in place so that uh, only certain people have access to the systems. And when I saw in the news about other banks that we didn't assess their system when they go through uh, data breach, then I felt that the work that I was supporting our clients really helped them to safeguard their systems and they're not in the front page uh, newspapers. So I've been doing that for 10 years now and uh, I'm really enjoying it. That's great. We love to hear that people are actually enjoying STEM because STEM can be fun. It's not, it's not boring, as boring as we think it is. Mm -hmm. So Ayla, would you like to, to share your, your perspective on that? Sure. So um, I'll give an example from my high school days. I distinctively remember my junior year environmental science course just pretty much clicked. I really enjoyed learning more about how everything is connected in the environment the earth sciences, how to use resources in a sustainable way, and the impact that humans have on the environment. Um, studying for the class was like surprisingly enjoyable. And this is the first time that I really wanted to learn more about a specific subject on my own. So from that environmental science course, I started exploring what types of courses were offered at colleges under the environmental science major. And that really helped direct my interests and make up my mind for my senior year when I was applying to college. So I ended up getting my undergraduate and master's degree in environmental science. And I distinctively remember um, thinking back to that, that high school course um, that kind of just clicked for me. So I encourage you, if there's, if there's something you find interested in, like interest in, start exploring that topic more outside of your current courses. Um, you may find a related field that piques your interest even more as well, but do take that initiative to kind of explore, um, explore things that, that stick out to you as, as really neat. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, let's not let fear hold us back from trying new things. And last but not least, Veselina, please take it ahead and please share with us your journey. Yeah, I actually had a very similar experience and story to Ayla. I, um, I 
I grew up in a mathematics family. My parents both went to mathematics schools and they were very, they encouraged me growing up to study math, math, math. And thankfully I liked it and I was good at it. Um, <laughs> but when I was going to college, my parents wanted me to choose a, t you know, a, a subject, a major that was math heavy. Um, and I took a econ class in high school and I was like, okay, I get it. I understand it. Maybe I'll do econ, but I'll still, I'll still do international studies because I wanted, you know, to rebel against my parents and do something that's a little bit different and international focus. Uh, lucky for me, I actually loved economics. I loved studying for it. It just clicked in my mind. I couldn't understand why it clicked in my mind. I was the girl that, that tutored everybody in my dorm uh, in micro. Um, and I ended up, you know, being very passionate. I actually ended up going back and doing my master's in international economics and international studies. So really combining both of those, you know, passion areas together. And I was able to find my way um, in Deloitte in our public sector practice. And, you know, I never knew that this entire world existed in international economics and, you know, working with other, you know, with countries and, and in the public sector and helping, you know, um, just working in so many diverse areas in that uh, really would not have happened if my parents <laughs> did not encourage me to do and to study math growing up um, and really exploring this passion for uh, for econ and for math. So um, I definitely encourage anybody, you know, listen to your parents. I know that's something that, yeah, not everybody, uh, you know, your mom knows best, whatever. I'm, I'm not saying that that's what happened to me, but I'm very lucky that I was, a, that, you know, I had very supportive parents who did push me to explore things that they knew that I would uh, be good at and ended up, you know, having a career um, in, in this field as well. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm so also happy to talk more about econ and international studies because of course I'm very passionate about it and data in general. So uh, everything, Kristen, that you were saying in the introduction definitely resonates with where we're going next. So I highly encourage everybody to follow a career in STEM because of that. That's great. That's such a great point. You know, social change is, should not just be intersectional, it's also interdisciplinary. And I think we should all, always keep that in mind. Um, when you were all talking about your journeys, one of the recurring themes we we're hearing was, I wanted to try STEM, but it was a very intimidating or it was a little bit scary. So I think that brings us to our next question. So how might we help girls have more confidence in their STEM abilities, you know, to take that class, to apply for that job? What advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your career or your STEM educational journey? So why don't we start off with Ayla? Would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, so for my career in energy, I'd give my younger self the advice um, and to others that just because you're going into a typically a male dominated field for, for me, that was energy, that shouldn't intimidate you or prevent you from being there. I didn't realize that it was um, a really male focused field until I started getting more focused on energy, building energy use and energy supply. Um, and I found myself to be one of few females in the room after a while. Um, so I tell myself, don't be intimidated by entering a room full of men. Don't be afraid to speak up and ask questions. Like you're, you're at the table for a reason. And even if you somehow end up somewhere new um, that doesn't disqualify you from asking questions and participating um, in the conversation. Um, and lastly, I give myself the advice to explore and join more local clubs and volunteer groups in STEM to leverage your network early on. Um, nowadays, there's so many virtual meetups to take advantage of and build your network and get to know what other people's career paths look like. So I've met so many mentors in like later in my career this way but I wish I would have done this a bit earlier. I mean, even in high school, even in college, you can still network and, and join these groups. So my advice would have been start, start earlier. That's, that's some really great advice. My brother was the one who got me into robotics in the first place, you know? So sometimes it takes someone to believe in you before you believe in yourself. So now I would also like to hear um, from Nanjala about your answer to this question. Would you like to share your perspective? Uh, sure. Uh, so I think uh, as uh, Ayla and, uh, and uh, Sadia mentioned, I think in these stem cells, sometimes the, the fear you have is, okay, I can't do it. Uh, you know, I, I am a girl or I'm a female. This is uh, only 
like a boy or guys thing to do. So I would say, you know, get that confidence and also prepare and uh, study the area of your interest because uh, when you know your, your whatever that you're interested in, uh, in the field of STEM, then that builds up your confidence. So if you are going to uh, present to a group of people, prepare ahead of time, learn this subject area, and I find that to be helpful even in my uh, current uh, profession uh, career is uh, if we're going to present uh, a topic to a client, make sure that you know that uh, topic well in advance and anticipate questions. And uh, it's, it's okay if you don't know it and, and you raise your hand and ask somebody. So don't feel that by asking a question, then it's a sign that you are weak or you, you don't know the area. So it's best to, un to ask questions than uh, you know, try to wing it. And I would say the advice that I'll give myself uh, is to make sure to maintain uh, relationships. Uh, so currently probably you have classmates that you're going through college together. Maintain those relationships after you graduate and as you start your careers because uh, you never know those might be your future clients, might be your future employers. Uh, so just maintain relationships uh, with all your uh, you know, high school and college uh, friends. Thank you. That was, yeah, of course, that, that was a really great answer, you know, like keep that network, keep those connections. And I think you just gave a wonderful introduction to our next question, which is about mentorship, really, you know, developing those relationships. So now I would like to know, um, have you had any mentors in your career? And if so, like, how did you even get someone to be your mentor? You know, do you have maybe any advice for people who don't know how to navigate things when you know, as you said, like, sometimes you're going to be the only girl in the room. Like, how, how do you make those connections? So, um, Vesalina, why don't you, why don't you answer this question first? Yeah, um, so mentorship has been a, 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 a big part of why I've been successful throughout my career. Um, I've had really great mentors um, throughout different parts of my, of, of my journey, of my professional journey, starting from, you know, undergrad to where I am now. Um, that is something to keep in mind that mentors, you will have different mentors at different types of your life and definitely take advantage of uh, those relationships. The way that I would advise you to build relationships is you know, as easy as, as being confident and being able to go um, and, and, and ask for help, right? Or the way that I approach that in undergrad is I went to office hours all the time. <laughs> I was the person that, you know, would uh, really take advantage of my professor's office hours where, you know, they would, ha where I would spend an hour each week outside of class in office hours. And actually through that, I was able to develop a really strong relationship with one of my professors who encouraged me uh, to go and get my master's and, you know, and pursue this other career path that I wasn't, uh, that I didn't even know existed out there in international studies and international economics. So she She's definitely been a huge mentor of mine throughout my career, even though I do not speak to her on a daily basis by any means. Um, and I talk to her probably once a year or once every two years, but she has been a, a very important mentor in my life. The way that I've approached it professionally at Deloitte and um, is, you know, at Deloitte, we're encouraged to set up meetings with our partners, with our senior managers, with our leaders. And I've definitely taken advantage of when, you know, one of my partners said, hey, I love talking to you. If you want to put, you know, a recurring meeting on my calendar, please feel free to do that. I would love, you know, to connect uh, with you more often. And when you have those opportunities and when people are like, actually, like, I love talking to you. Let's, you know, keep this up. Take advantage of that. Don't be afraid afraid of it. Don't be, you know, afraid that you're bugging somebody because, you know, you're putting time on their calendar. Uh, you know, our leader is leaders in companies or in any place, they, they want to mentor, they want to help you and they want to help guide you. Sometimes you might not find that their advice, you know, sometimes advice from mentors um, is, is good. And other times, you know, it might not resonate with you. However, it doesn't mean that you, uh, you should not uh, follow up with conversations and, and just keeping those people in your, in, in your life is important because you never know when their advice is going to become uh, relevant in, throughout your career journey. So definitely uh, take advantage of those opportunities where, you know, people are encouraging you to, to show up <laughs> to office hours or to, you know, to set up meetings. 
you said something really great that you're not bugging anyone for for wanting to talk to someone from learning and i think as a freshman in college i'm going to keep that advice in mind when i go to office hours so i would also like to hear from sadia about this question would you like to answer please sure um, so I kind of want to touch on a lot of points that Selena said. Um, I agree with most of them. So for me personally, mentorship was a big part of where uh, and how I got here. Um, and a lot of it is also very like unofficial. So the thing about mentorship for me is I, one thing I realized, it's not always like the mentor just kind of falls into your lap, but it's more so you're kind of seeking them out by um, tapping into your network. Um, you know, if, if I was interested in, let's say, coming to Deloitte, and I know somebody who was at Deloitte, working within cybersecurity, then it's something as simple as like me reaching out to them and asking, how's your experience at Deloitte? How is it working within cybersecurity? And then, you know, them kind of giving me that path forward and, and um, giving me like the step one, two, and three, this is how I got here. This is what you should do. And that's actually how I did end up coming to Deloitte. I just reached out to one person in my network and they literally just gave me a whole layout of the pros, the cons, um, why I should come, how it would be instrumental in my career, I can connect you with this person and that person. I think where it can get discouraging is there are also sometimes where you come across people and you might ask them a question kind of for help and, and they're not so forthcoming or they don't really want to help you. But that's something I learned not to really take personal because it could just be a lot of different things. But it's just kind of, okay, move on to the next person or you know tap into the next network. Um, even switching over from a healthcare background to um, IT. And when I started doing that um, job at Accenture, I was terrified at first, even though they told me they're gonna train me for a whole month. But, you know, of course, at some point I was exposed to um, coding and I was just kind of thrown in the middle of something. And I had people where, you know, I reached out to my brothers and then they reached out to their friends or I reached out to my friends and then they reached out to their friends. So you end up just connecting with so many people through a friend of a friend or whatever. But I think the biggest thing is just asking for that help or asking that question and continuously asking, like don't just ever get stuck um, by yourself or, uh, you know, not seek out that help uh, because there are people that are wanting to help you and willing to help you. And I think sometimes it's a lot better to also get that advice from someone who's already experienced something or who could provide you that little bit of wisdom rather than you kind of just throwing yourself into something. So always seek advice and reach out to people. That's what I do like till today. That, that's really wonderful. You know, we, we keep learning every single day and Speaking about learning and like asking and, and just like trying to grow our knowledge, um, I would like to know what do you think STEM careers will look like in the next five to ten years? Like what skills should girls like or youth leaders should be think thinking about right now that, you know, we're starting to study, we are thinking of what classes we want to take. Um, so Nanjela, would you like to, to talk a little bit about your perspective on this topic? Uh, thank you. So I would say, uh, I think the trend now is more to uh, regarding uh, automation and, uh, and also cloud-based uh, computing. So automation meaning, so there are several tasks, there are certain tasks that are repetitive. So uh, what the uh, technology is now is to make sure like those repetitive uh, tasks, if there's a way to automate them so that it's not a human being that is performing uh, those tasks. So for automation, uh, the skill sets, uh, you know, girls would need to have, I, I see that you're in that field, uh, is to learn about robotics, because then that will help you understand how do you automate uh, a process. And then the other field, I think that's going to be, uh, uh, or which has already started being uh, uh, prevalent is uh, cloud computing. So you might have heard uh, a lot about uh, like Amazon and their cloud computing. So Amazon is able to deliver services to uh, people across the, the countries because they're able to facilitate all those services using uh, cloud computing. So I would say uh, cloud computing and uh, uh, automation. That sounds really interesting. I'm gonna go into my college course catalog and I'm gonna see what I can do because what you said sounds really wonderful. Um, so now I want to hear from Ayla, like, what is your perspective on this? Sure. So, um, in my opinion, I think climate change will continue to be a huge field for STEM careers as it has global effects and continues to be a topic in the daily news. 
Um, but understanding the sciences behind climate change issues crosses so many STEM fields, like the, the earth sciences, data analytics, biology, chemistry, um, energy in general. Um, so it, there's, there's so many opportunities and climate change, I think is gonna just, yeah, be really important. And if you are in any of those fields, understand that you can really contribute to helping solve or alleviate uh, the effects from climate change. But I would say it's also extremely important to understand um, some, I don't know if it's a softer skill, but how to create policies to implement solutions and strategies to combat um, climate change. This same idea applies to other major sciences, major science areas. Like you'll, you'll need to understand so many aspects of a topic, um, know the different sides of an issue, and um, you're gonna need to know how to formulate policy around that area and educate and communicate what you know to others. Um, I think some other softer skills that will be important regardless of what STEM area you're in is like project management or managing teams, um, communicating effectively to all types of audiences. Um, so that's what I've experienced. And I think that those, all of those skills together will be really important in, in all types of STEM fields moving forward. That's really, really important right now. You know, like climate change is not just about lawmakers. You need lawmakers to make the policies, but you need um, STEM people to actually make them a reality. So thank you for bringing that up. And I think kind of like with that, since I see we have some time, so I would like to ask another question. Um, so how can we use STEM to use, um, like to solve these transnational issues? Do you have any examples of how maybe you've worked implementing this STEM for social good or some countries or companies that are doing a really great job? Um, Sadia, I don't know if you have any examples of this. Um, I'm sure you probably have. Sure, so yeah, you know, kind of again, when I was um, changing paths from healthcare to IT, the reason or something that has helped me was kind of coming to that realization, IT is actually able to uh, be global and it's like transnational in the sense where if I'm passionate about uh, developing countries and their uh, access to medicine, then, you know, they're doing STEM and IT in the sense where there's a lot of uh, people who are taking up telemedicine and coming up with applications and um, systems that actually help that. Uh, you see just kind of like, uh, I think it was Nangela and Isla, I'm not sure, was talking about how a lot of the work we do, we actually see in the news. So you see it's something that's making an impact for social good. I mean, something as, you know, relevant as COVID right now. Um, it's on the news, but a lot of healthcare agencies and, uh, and, you know, organizations are also doing a lot of things on the back end that require STEM and IT, where they're making sure that uh, whether it's creating systems to better track or um, finding ways to better facilitate uh, coming up with a vaccine. It's something that you see consistently in the news. So I think that um, IT and STEM has a, a big impact on social good and uh, especially on a global scale. It's something that the two are very much intertwined in my opinion. And you know what, that's, that's a great opinion and a mentality to have. So thank you so much for, for sharing this. And I feel like I, I can't ask this question uh, without asking our wonderful expert on international studies, Veselina. So why don't you share your perspective on this topic? So much pressure. Um, I actually, uh, this is, um, it, the first thing that comes to mind is a, a project or um, a thought process, thought piece that I actually have been working on for the last couple months uh, with the response to COVID and really focusing on the digital component. So exactly what Sadia was saying, technology. So the, the world has become more globally connected, obviously the and technology and the uh, connectivity of the world has been improving. Um, and, you know, with the with COVID right now, one of the, the things that we have been seeing is, is closing of economies. And the people that have been, uh, the, the small and medium-sized enterprises or, you know, or entrepreneurs that have been the most successful have been ones that have been able to employ digital solutions and um, ICT solutions. And ICT is information communi uh, communication technologies, if you're not aware with that term. Um, and the one, the, the research that I was doing is how can, um, you know, how can small and medium-sized enterprises uh, 
adopt uh, digital marketplaces, for instance, or adopt other types of solutions to connect to the world and to expand and become more resilient, economically resilient in cases like like COVID right now, where where your um, where your economies can be closed, right? We've seen people that have been more successful when they are able to employ those solutions and when they're able to deliver their goods and services to other people in the um, in the world. And that is, you know, technology. Uh, we have to think about technology of, of opening networks, right? Opening and connecting people to uh, both local and global networks. So I do believe that that is going to continue to become a very important prevalence um, in the future. And we're going to see more of those, um, you know, those barriers being broken where uh, a successful entrepreneur that is, you know, that lives in one part, you know, in a, in a very secluded part of the world can be connected to these global networks and still get their product and get their, you know, their services out there and, and still be successful. So I only see that, um, you know, continuing to grow. And I think you know, uh, right now with you know, with the world, how it's been in the last five months, you know, with COVID, we've only been seeing more advances in those technologies and, and able to connect to those global networks. That's a, that's a really, really great answer. Um, and now I think I'm going to ask some questions that we have from our attendees because let's, you know, let's try to show the people, you know, give the people what they want. Um, and I found some really wonderful questions. Um, one of them being like, how can one become a, a steminist? And for those of you who don't know what a steminist is, it's a play on words between the word STEM and feminist. And it's basically someone who advocates for equal opportunities in STEM fields. So we're talking about, you know, making sure that everyone has um, that equality in these fields. So to start us off, um, why don't we go with Nanjola? You know, how can, how can we become feminists? Thank you for the question. So I think uh, one thing is for, to identify uh, mentors or women in those positions in the field that you are interested in. So if it's environment or if it's in data analytics and then learn from them uh, how they got to where they are. So for example, in our organization, we have, uh, from time to time, we have groups of uh, women uh, partners and seniors who would have meetings with uh, other professionals and share their experience and they uh, provide advice to uh, other staff so that uh, they can share like how they got there and any, any mistakes they make so that other people uh, don't make those mistakes. And, uh, and then just encourage uh, women to, uh, to, uh, to learn more in those uh, areas. So I would say to uh, asking and use your network and also use your mentors. Great, that's a great pathway to take for all of us who are trying to advocate for, for equality in STEM fields. Um, so Ayla, would you like to also answer this question? Sure. So. Um... I, I agree. Definitely, definitely leverage your network and your mentors. Um, for me, I, I feel like I've tried to learn more about women in history and women in history and the sciences um, and just some of the issues that they've faced over time. So it, some of the books that I've read are, um, they compare, I guess, like females versus males and the way that they handle things and like encouraging females to speak up for themselves more, which is, I know that's not specific to STEM, but you can, like I said, learning about, I guess, the, the history of STEM and the, the role that women play. And I think that would just be one opportunity to, to become a STEMist. And, on, and then always like lift up your other, you know, female colleagues, support them, ask them how what what they need from you and you know vice versa i think it's it's really relying upon other powerful strong women that's uh been helpful that's super important you know uplifting each other up and you know just making sure that this is truly a safe space for everyone that we're working with um so another question we have um from our attendees is actually about imposter syndrome how to deal with it in, in college, um, in high school, or in our careers. For those of you who don't know, imposter syndrome is basically this mentality when you're in a room and you feel like you don't belong. Either 
because by the way you look or your experience or you feel like you're not qualified enough. So how, how can we deal with that? Um, and how have you dealt with this? Um, Sadia, would you like to, to share your perspective? Sure. Um, yeah, and, and that's a really good question. So to be honest, I'm, yeah, I'm very familiar with imposter syndrome, and I think that's something very common more than not, where um, something that helped me, at least I'll say for me, I know it's something that I struggle with, especially uh, within STEM, uh, for many different reasons, where first it could just be like, okay, why am I sitting in this room with, with all these men that are speaking about all this stuff in, in IT, and then they're talking about their backgrounds and engineering and this and that, and then their family history of how you know, their fathers and therefore, like, it's totally different than for me, where it's like, my family, I'm probably the first woman who's in STEM. So I feel by default, very just instantly always uncomfortable. But what I realized, to be honest, is it's more of a personal thing. Um, you can change that dynamic more for yourself, especially a when you realize that almost everybody is dealing with it, even people who are at the top leadership levels um, are, you know, sometimes not so maybe confident in their abilities and I think when it, it's a very it, it, it's anything it sabotages yourself so if you have that but you're not showing up or you're not allowing yourself to show up um, then it's automatically kind of gonna give that uh, negative impact that it, it creates a negative situation so let's say I'm feeling imposter syndrome something that I know that I've been working through at least uh, over the years is just really making sure that I'm showing up. Um, and I think one of the best advice that someone has ever given me was he told me, you know, wherever you're sitting at, whatever table you're sitting at, speak up, even if your voice shakes. And if your voice shakes, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, like you can look at yourself in the mirror and um, have that self-respect for yourself. Um, and you know that you spoke up no matter what. And I think that, little piece of advice honestly was very phenomenal for me because it's helped me at least just be at tables at work um, and just kind of just show up and be a little bit more out of my head and um, when I started doing that it also started just creating better opportunities for me because you're not really playing into that or sabotaging or you know not speaking up um, so I think it's really it also requires I think a lot of self-reflection and personal work um, making sure that you are just out of your own head and you understand that this is, you know, you deserve to be here. You know how you got here. You know what you did to get here. There's no reason why you should feel that way. So just uh, show up and work at it every day and it gets better over time. Thank you for, for your answer on that one. Um, so Veselina, would you also like to, to answer this question about imposter syndrome? Yeah, actually I would. I. Um... I was going to start with how many times I felt like an imposter in a room uh, throughout my career. You know, I uh, I was the youngest in my in my first company, uh, and I started my first job at the age of 21, <laughs> and you know, and, and was the youngest in my company for two years. So I definitely know you can can relate to it. Um, I think one thing and everything that Sadia said just resonated so much with me about you know showing up, speaking up. I think that's really important. And and at the end of the day, to battle in imposter syndrome is to, to be confident, to be confident in yourself and to be confident in your abilities and in your experiences. And the one thing you should always remember is that your experiences and your perspectives are unique and everything that, you know, that how you've gone to this point, you're di how you've gone to this point is different probably than somebody else in the room. So your opinion and your perspective is as much of a value uh, to the to the people in the room and to solving problems as much as anybody else. So really, you know, encourage everybody to be confident in their own abilities and their own experiences and be proud of that. Um, and and that is the, the one way that, you know, that's the best way to, to battle imposter syndrome because you should not feel like an imposter. You should feel confident and proud of your own abilities and uh, all the experiences uh, that you've had to this point. That's really, really important to, to keep in mind, you know, when, when you have our, our inner person that's like sabotaging ourselves, like we don't want to be sabotaging ourselves. We have to cheer for, for each other and also that includes ourselves. So um, we have um, one question specifically talking about resources. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit uh, more general because it talks about a, a specific place in the world. So how can, as girls, so sometimes we can be in 
secondary school, so we're not even like in college yet. And we may not have as many STEM opportunities as we would like. Unfortunately, STEM right now is a privilege to many people. So now we'd like to ask, you know, how do we go about finding those resources when it seems like we don't have any? So um, Angela, would you like to um, share some advice in how we can grow our STEM fields um, and like our knowledge on that? Yes, uh, so I would say uh, you can start with, uh, like if you have your uh, school counselors, they may have information, or if your school has still maintained relationships with uh, uh, alumni, they may have that information and they can invite them to the school and uh, offer a presentation. Uh, if anyone, uh, any alumni work in the STEM field, they can come and give presentation to the school about uh, that field and what they do. And then uh, that will also, that will expose the students uh, to those fields and that will help to build uh, interest in those fields. So I would say starting with the, uh, the, the counselors and, uh, and alumni. Yes, exactly what we've been talking about, you know, use your network because even if your immediate network doesn't know anyone, there is someone that knows someone that knows someone. Um, so um, Sadia, would you like to also answer this question? Sure, I could add. Um, so for me, I actually have a lot of um, family in Toronto, uh, Canada, but it's interesting because what, what I've noticed is the resources that we have here, especially being like the DC area, uh, and access to IT is completely different um, around many different places. So just speaking to my cousins alone, you, I'll see the, the difference in um, the information that they have access to or, um, you know, things that kind of just fall more into our lap here in the DC area that for them, it's like someone has to really put themselves out there. I would say um, kind of to what Nanjela said of reaching out, of course, uh, to counselors and stuff. And then if that's not something where you feel like you're getting information, then, um, you know, utilizing and researching uh, the World Wide Web, there's so much um, different groups and different meetups and um, different, like, uh, gr uh, group me accounts that people are connecting, uh, even on a global level, uh, particularly about IT. Uh, and then also, I found LinkedIn to be very informational on my end, where, you know, just creating a LinkedIn account, um, whatever it is that you're interested in, uh, putting it there, if you're if you're getting a cert in that um you know put it out there and then from there just kind of messaging people and if somebody's even in a whole nother country like totally away from you just reaching out to them and asking them like how did you get into uh this uh, career what were the steps you took um you know i don't have access to any of those programs or certs or whatever but um you know just i think the internet has made everything so easy now and we're all so connected so even if it's not in your actual area or you can't find uh, access to anyone, you could literally talk to someone on the other side of the world and get the same uh, information that you need. So just being open-minded in that way. Great, you know, like trying to, to keep in mind, like, you know, that any connection is valuable and just trying to, you know, find the best way we can to reach our goals. Um, so now we're starting to wrap up. Um, so I'm gonna go with one final question that I would like um, everyone here to answer. Um, and you can make this question your own. You know, if there's something that you really wanted to say, but you feel like you didn't have the chance to, now's the time to share that. Um, so very generally, you know, what can we do to promote gender equality in STEM fields, either as a student from your perspective, or, you know, when we think about that, what comes to your mind? So um, let's start off with Ayla. Um, that's a that's a big question. Um, I think we we need additional resources and mentors to really hone in on females in STEM fields, like starting from, I mean, down to elementary school, middle school, high school, and just encourage any other females in your life, whether they're like your nieces and nephews or younger siblings to just explore different opportunities in the, in the sciences, technology, mathematics, you know. Um, I, think, I think schools probably could invest some more resources into women in these areas, but, um, but that also requires advocacy. Um, a lot gets done through advocacy, through local groups, through, um, you know, and through, through 
groups of people, you become like a larger voice with whatever you're trying to advocate. So if there's, if there's something in your community, whether you're, you know, like internationally, um, I think you can find some allies that you want to discuss issues with and you can bring that up to someone that you think is, you know, has, has the, I don't know, let's say power, but is a decision maker, whether it's like local government, um, or your, like I said, your, your school or counselors. But I think those are, those are some opportunities, but you can also, I mean, again, now everything's digital, especially with COVID, everyone's online. I mean, I know I saw one of the questions was, can you pursue STEM online? And absolutely. I mean, there's so many, there's so many websites that you can just take free courses on too. You don't necessarily have to pay for them. Um, and I, I, when I got my graduate degree, a lot of my courses were online because I worked full time. And so I did courses at night um, or I did a couple courses online. So definitely explore some of the, just type in like science courses online or whatever your area of interest is because there's a, there's a lot of things online now too that you can leverage, so. That, that's some really great advice, you know, like sometimes we don't know how many opportunities or resources are there until, until we look at them. So Nandela, would you like to also go next? Yes, uh, so I think uh, I would say, uh, I agree with what Ayla said, but I think also uh, we should also be open to take on uh, leadership roles so that we, we are part of the uh, uh, group that are making decisions so that if we are part of, uh, even from uh, starting from college, if, if it's the uh, school board organization, uh, you know, make sure that you participate as a leader so that when you're making decisions, then there's somebody there, uh, a girl or a woman that is sharing the experience and sharing, uh, you know, provide suggestions as what can be done. And if you're part of that group, uh, make sure that you lift others as you go up so that there are more. So the more women there are in uh, management level or in boards, then I think we'll be able to uh, make change with regards to uh, women equality in uh, STEM. But I think it's just making that decision to take on leadership and be, uh, uh, you know, speak up and be part of uh, uh, management or group that makes decisions uh, that impact women. That's just fantastic. You know, let's get more women into the decision making table. That's a great, a great point to, to conclude with. Um, so Vaselina, please take it away now. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. Like for me, whenever I've been empowered to be in that leadership role or to be in a position where I can speak up, I've definitely brought, um, you know, the, that change that I wanted to see uh, up for it. and remember to, to use those opportunities uh, to, you know, to advocate for what you value. And I think, you know, everybody that joined today and, and that, uh, you know, that showed up to this meeting, obviously this is something that you value very strongly in um, and continue to do that because the more that you can join these type of meetings and these type of opportunities and speak up um, and be edu and get uh, educate not only yourself, but others around you on this topic, that is how we're going to see the change that we want to see in the world, where it's not, it doesn't happen overnight, <laughs> and we're going to have to speak up, and we're going to have to continue to advocate for ourselves, but if you can remember that, and you can keep that in, you know, in the back of your mind to be that change that you want to see, then we will be able to, to get towards that equality that we want to see in the world. That's really, that's really incredible. And so now um, to, to conclude, Sadia, would you like to answer the question? Sure. Um, pretty much what uh, Isla, Vaselina, and uh, Nanjala said, uh, you know, just mentorship. Uh, I think if we had mentorship uh, within our fields where, I know it took for me another woman in leadership to kind of um, have a side conversation with me. And then she told me about how you know, she's felt at a table or her experience. And then, you know, that I think just being in these, even this type of discussion that we're having today, people sharing their experiences and um, normalizing certain things and talking about how we can, um, you know, pick, like move or make a situation better for us if we feel like we're getting the shorter end of the stick, I think are very impactful. Uh, and then 
pretty much honestly what Beth and Leo was saying, the last part about just advocating for yourself. Like if you start with yourself and, and, and you learn to, you know, speak up, uh, if you feel like uh, you're not getting access to certain resources or, um, you, you know, you are looking for uh, better opportunities, just if you're advocating for yourself, then you're advocating for the next person and then you're able to advocate for, you know, it really starts with yourself. So just learning that and then from there, just, it's kind of going to hopefully um, go down uh, into a spiral, of just a greater change for everyone. That's great. We, we love to hear about chain reactions and change in the world. Um, so now uh, we have concluded our, our panel and thank you so much to each one of you for sharing your stories, your incredible advice. I think I've learned a lot. I think our attendees have learned a lot. A lot. So we're really grateful for your time and for everyone who showed up for this. And we had a lot of questions about resources and finding things out. Remember that Girl Up is an international, um, you know, international network that has lots of incredible partners, just like Deloitte. Like we have these events that are online with these wonderful people that you can learn about. But also Girl Up has um, STEM boot camps. It has STEM grants. If you want to pursue a STEM project for social good, it can give you funding. There are some incredible um, programs um, like YSI. So if you want to learn more about all these programs and the boot camps and everything that's going on, please go to girlup.org slash STEM. You're going to find out there are so many digital manuals. There are so many grants and there are so many companies that Girl Up partners with um, that truly also believe in this message. We actually have um, an upcoming STEM bootcamp on Friday, October 2nd. So if you're interested in, you know, like dipping your toe into STEM and, you know, like taking that first initial step, it is a great opportunity for, uh, you know, girls that are watching for here to, to register and to just, you know, get that first class and get that first experience. So once again, please go to gallup.org um, slash STEM. And with that said, um, once again, um, thank you so much for your time and from your perspectives, we really appreciate it. And, you know, let's keep those advice, um, all of the advice you said in mind, you know, let's use STEM as a tool to, to really change the world. So once again, thank you for such a wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.